Thanks. This uh, meeting is being recorded. Thanks, Hamish. Um, I uh, yeah, I really appreciate being asked to speak today. Um, thanks to everyone at um, Digital Communities Wales and and the network, um, and thanks to uh, the Minister Jane Hutt for coming to listen to what people say. Um, Bonadar Paub, um, I'm Gwyn. I work for the Big Issue, um, which is a group made up of various different parts, um, which I'll just briefly go through. Um, the main parts of the Big Issue company, which you probably know about, which produces the best selling magazine and supports vendors across the UK to sell it, as well as developing developing new ideas sort of based on the ethos of, um, t of uh, helping people out of poverty through um, offering kind of self-help and um, a hand up, not a handout. There's also a sort of social investment arm, Big Issue Invest, and um, then the Big Issue Foundation, which is a reg registered charity that focuses on additional support needs of Big Issue vendors across the UK. So I'm just coming to the end of a Welsh Government funded project in Wales with the Big Issue Company, um, where I've been working on digital inclusion and financial inclusion with vendors in, in Wales, pretty much sort of mid and south Wales. Um, and I've just started a new role within the Big Issue Foundation as Programmes Manager for the UK, where I'll be responsible for financial and digital inclusion work we do there as well. So I'm, I'm not going anywhere, really. Um, this area is really unique, digital inclusion and financial inclusion, um, in that it's shared across the whole sort of frontline staff team in the Big Issue group, whether they're in the company or the foundation, because it's, it's really so important to all of our shared aims because of what the Big Issue does, which is a, attempt to create a better world for everyone, support people out of poverty um, through, um, yeah, like I said, through self-help and through sort of business and financial solutions. Um, so the big issues digital inclusion work began with supporting vendors to go cashless, that is to stop relying on cash to sell the magazine essentially, um, along with all the benefits that come with that um, and become able to accept contactless payments. Um, as I'll come on to, data is really important for this, uh, mobile data. And we distribute smartphones and card readers, support vendors to access official ID, which many of them don't have, and bank accounts, um, which many of them don't have, um, and then eventually get set up with a mobile app um, and a card reader and, and essentially be able to, um, to avoid cash altogether, which obviously became really important during the pandemic and, and, and even since then. Um, so it's been a really successful project. Um, there's some press recently about how we've um, we've allowed a, a, thou a thousand vendors now to um, to go cashless across the UK. Um, part of that, um, like I said, is data is really important for that, um, and we've been really, really um, privileged to be um, to sort of connect with Good Things Foundation. And Emma's speaking later, but um, uh, Good Things Foundation have given us access to the data bank. Um, which allows people to address the sort of data poverty problem by um, distributing free mobile data um, in a partnership with O2. So since then around 30 vendors in Wales have gained access to free mobile data as part of that scheme and around 120 vendors across the UK as a whole. So as you can see the, the, the value of having a dedicated full-time staff member um, on digital inclusion work is really obvious there because Wales is is steaming you know that's me I'm not to blow my own trumpet but it's just nowhere else has someone who's dedicated to financial and digital inclusion so Wales is obviously steaming ahead with that um, you know supporting vendors to get access to data in that way um, so we can see the value and we know that data is really important to our vendors I don't really have to get time to go into like the whole cross-section of different vendors that we have because it's quite a diverse group um, and not just limited to homeless and vulnerably housed people but also families and people from the Roma community and migrant um, families and anyone really living in poverty um, for whom selling the magazine can be a step up to improving their situation, improving their skills, improving their income. But data is important to all of our vendors as it is to anyone and, and it's expensive, which is perhaps more of an issue for our vendors than it is for many. So it, that is an issue for many right now. So many vendors don't have good or reliable Wi-Fi connections at home. Um, that's something we know. We don't have loads of data about data poverty in our vendor cohort, but hopefully this is useful for me to give you some anecdotal information and some of what we what we do know from conversations with the people we work with. So 
our vendors may be living in overcrowded houses where devices are shared between families um, or they may be living at the other end of the spectrum kind of in homeless hostels where there's no wi-fi available at all um, mobile data is often the only access to the internet that our vendors have um, they need data to sell the magazine if they're cashless they, they also need data or credit to stay in touch with us to send an email or a whatsapp to all sorts of different places whether that's support workers um, keeping informed about, about appointments, um, speak to housing providers, financial services to prevent, you know, to prevent financial problems looming and, and increasing to find a way out of those kind of situations. Speak to doctors, dentists, um, not to mention friends and family. Um, people even need it, you know, so they can check the map on Google to see that they're going to the right place so a day's not wasted or to listen to music when they've had a bad day, um, you know, just the same as we all we all use the internet for all sorts of things like this that this is many vendors only only route to internet access um so yeah basically the the data bank scheme has been really really popular um we know that data poverty is huge among our vendors even though i can't give you any hard hard information or graphics about that um and i think it's also worth mentioning it's not always what you think it may look like um, I recently found out a vendor I've known for years is spending, he says, around £60 a month on his mobile data. Uh, and that's in addition to now being on part of the data bank scheme. So he's in his 50s or 60s. Um, he has a long term stable accommodation in a flat and he loves listening to music. Um, that's how he relaxes. And he plugs his phone into his TV and streams his music um, all the time when he's at home which kind of blew my mind when I discovered this. And and I think it's it's not always easy to understand the reasons behind people's kind of digital exclusion. And, and um, but really for him, I feel like it, a lot of it is around a lack of confidence and um, he doesn't really feel confident or able to find a cheaper solution. He's worried about signing contracts, I think due to issues with financial problems in the past. And he feels nervous that he won't be eligible anyway. So it's taken a few of these conversations before he started to say yes to the offer of some support to find a better solution. So we're still still getting there. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll tie things up there because I know we're, we're um, on a tight schedule. But um, yeah, happy to talk more about there's so many other anecdotes I can talk about. But um, yeah, thanks for having me. Well, well, Gwyn, thank you so much for a really, a really insightful uh, uh, introduction to our session, actually, I think. Um, and I'm sure there will be lots of questions. Uh, I think Emma is going to talk more about the data bank. So, so um, hopefully that, that will answer questions about that. But, uh, but thank you. Thank you so much. And so, so please do put questions in the chat um, for Gwyn and we'll come back to those. Um, I'd, I'd like now to introduce um, uh, Catherine Namani, who's from Displaced People in Action. Hello everyone, um, I'm just going to put my timer on just in case I run over. Um, yeah, I'm from, um, I'm one of the, on the board of directors at Displaced Persons in Action and we work specifically with asylum seekers and refugees uh, to help um, settle them um, locally. Um, a lot of the issues that Gwyn mentioned are common across, across the piece, I'm sure people will recognise that. Um, but for refugees and asylum seekers in particular, um, as they're displaced, then they become totally isolated if they don't have access to internet or, or devices. Um, obviously, they divide, they're isolated from their families at home. They often don't know people locally. They've just arrived. Um, they have poor language skills. Um, a lot of the women from Afghanistan don't speak English, but they also don't read and write in their own language. Um, so that sort of creates much more of a barrier for them. And their digital skills are similarly quite poor. So um, that's you know, obviously you know, a, a big issue. Um, but on top of that, they're having to survive a on a £40.85 pence a week. Um, and with that amount of money, they have to sort of cover everything. So clothing, and very often they arrive with absolutely nothing. So they've got to buy clothes, um, food, toiletries, everything. So data comes a very low priority on, on that list of, of needs. Um, just going to talk about a, a, an example, a real life couple, although the names are invented. Um, a couple of asylum seekers from Afghanistan. Um, we'll call them Kareem and Farida. Um, they arrived in the UK 
they knew absolutely no one. Um, and their weekly allowance, as I mentioned, um, is being spent only on food, clothing, and other basic items, so toiletries and the like. Um, so they've got no money for additional, um, they can't buy devices, they can't enter into contracts because of the issues, similar issues to the, those that Gwyn has mentioned. Um, and also they just don't know where to go. So it's a bit of a vicious circle because if you don't know where to get the information, and you can't get the information because it's on a phone or on the internet, then you're, you know, in this downward spiral, um, really. Kareem speaks English, um, like many Afghan men who have come over, but his wife, Farida, not only doesn't speak English, um, making her totally reliant on her husband, but she doesn't read or write in Pashto, which is her own native language. Um, she's starting to learn with her husband's help, but again, she is very, very isolated. So they don't have a phone or a device. They have no access to Wi-Fi in the place where they are staying. Um, and that means that they don't have access to key information, health information, general information um, about the area um, and where to get help. Um, so when Farida suffered a miscarriage, she found herself completely alone. She's totally alone. She only had her husband for support. She couldn't speak to any other female um, member of the family because they were are in Afghanistan and had no access to support within the health system as well. In that sort of situation, how crucial data is. So the gift of a phone and a data package has enabled her to get in touch with her family at home and enable them to get support locally. So that's a sort of a fairly quite awful example, but quite typical um, in terms of how isolated and how difficult it is for asylum seekers in particular. What we really need is, you know, data about the numbers of asylum seekers. You know, we, it's very difficult to put for us to put in support we don't even know the numbers that we're dealing with on a, on a bigger scale. Um, we've got data about refugees but asylum seekers obviously is a bit more difficult and we're not, we don't know whether those figures are, are um, available. In 2020-2021 DPA ran a campaign um, and demand far exceeded what we were able to um, support but even within that we gave out a thousand phones, tablet devices and data packages um, and this is where we really need more resources, more help to sort of be able to address address that. Links then obviously with digital skills, um, time out, um, they need support digitally, they need support with language, they Ideally, you provide support for digital skills in the language um, before they start to sort of become more competent in English. But as I said, a lot of our issues are very common across the piece. Um, what Gwyn was saying uh, resonates very much with, with our client base as well. So um, that's our problems. Thank you very much, Catherine. I was saying that no, you shouldn't apologise. Uh, it's a very powerful story and, and thank you for sharing it with us. I think it, it, it highlights a really important issue. So thank you. And again, I'm sure there will be questions uh, for you. And, and just say one of the other thing, very nice to see people connecting in the chat with each other, which is another thing as a network we, we want to see happening. So that's that's great. Um, our third speaker um, is Geraint Turner, who's from Swansea MAD, um, and he's going to uh, give us his perspectives. Thanks, Hamish. Uh, hopefully I'm going to be sharing my screen and people will be able to see my screen if uh, someone just give me a, a yes. We can. Or no. Yes, we can. Oh. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, thank you, Hamish. As you said, I'm from Swansea Music Art Digital. Um, know quite a lot of people in the room, uh, but for those who don't know who Swansea Mad are, um, we're a grassroots anti-poverty, anti-racist, pro-equality, inclusive youth and community charity intolerant of discrimination and injustice. Driven by the advancement of social justice and equity, we work with young people and communities who are marginalized with systemic oppression to dismantle structures which support discrimination. So, um, a lot of the data poverty that we've um, been uh, working with and against for the last couple of years revolves a lot around infrastructure, access uh, and skills, among other things. There's quite a lot of things that people talk about today, 
Um, but just touching on these things a little bit today uh, within our time limit. So in terms of infrastructure, the gap between those with goods and services and those without seems to be growing. Um, fast fibre to premises in city centres is uh, getting better. Uh, and those living in communities that are more really rural or um, excluded, uh, then it is getting worse or is standing still. So people living in poverty, black and non-black people of colour, working class people, disabled people and rural communities are disproportionately, disproportionately affected uh, by data poverty. So some of the things that we've been trying to do um, to combat that uh, is what I'm going to be talking about uh, today. So I believe good internet should be a basic human right. Um, Maslow's hierarchy needs any basic human rights. Internet access and good internet access should be part of that. So we've been working with organisations such as Good Things Foundation, who will be looking from later on, and Digital Communities Wales, uh, among others, uh, public sector, private sector, anybody who we get donations from, to give out and distribute data SIM cards, uh, devices, whether they're tablets, laptops, refurbished equipment, anything we can get our hands on uh, during the first couple of months of lockdown. Uh, and over the last 12 months particularly, we've given out 250 SIM cards and devices to people in our community. Um, we've given out 63 within the last month alone, uh, and we've actually got a bit of a waiting list for data SIM cards. We are signed up to the data bank, and we're waiting for another um, shipment of uh, SIM cards. Um, and when the pandemic hit in March 2020, um, only 51% of households earning between £6,000 and £10,000 had home internet access compared to 99% of households and income over £40,000. Uh, and even when people um, had access to internet and equipment, they are less likely to have the skills to utilise it. So a lot of our work uh, has been improving people's skills, uh, low level skill, higher end skills, people trying to um, improve their own skills to get different jobs or multiple jobs in some circumstances, to try and ease the cost of living crisis on them. Um, and that's even without talking about what's going to come with the energy crisis that we're uh, starting to feel effects of, but may even get worse uh, in a couple of months. Um, so a lot of the digital skills that we're working around is information on digital literacy, basic things like if you're given a device, how then do you use that device? Getting on the internet, browsing the internet, uh, accessing your data online that is already there, so that could be your emails, it could be your Indeed profile, it could be um, your LinkedIn profile, your Facebook, anything, your Twitter, really low level stuff as well. Communication, so interacting, a lot of people are doing Zoom sessions or Microsoft Teams sessions, but as if you can't get onto their maps, how do you then access your support uh, and your support groups? Developing additional content, a lot of people who are working with at the moment are trying to get uh, their own content out there, whether that's TikTok, YouTube, uh, their own websites, their own profiles to try and sell things or raise their own profile. Uh, just to try and get a second income, third income for a lot of people. Online safety is a big thing that we work around. Um, it's well, very well and good. People haven't been given a device, but if they're not safe to not using it safely, they're putting themselves at risk, whether that's internet banking uh, or accessing uh, profiles online and not doing that safely. Uh, and problem solving is uh, a little bit of a, a higher level for a lot of people. Um, so solving technical problems, what happens when you get a pop up that you don't like? Uh, how do you know that a website is secure? Um, really uh, necessary things that um, people are, are, are struggling with. So the gaps aren't getting any smaller, we find. Um, a lot of people are coming to us because they know that we're in the community, we're well connected with people. Um, we get asked on a daily basis, are you able to get source laptops or um, tablets or SIM cards? Um, and as much as we want to be able to help everyone, it's only the tip of the iceberg. We're not doing enough uh, in general to solve the problem, there's not good enough infrastructure, there's not good enough access, there's not everybody's got the skills that they need. And that's pretty much it, really. Um, so looking forward to the rest of the day uh, and the rest of the session um, as well. So thank you. Thanks very much, Geraint. Um, that, that, that's great. And, uh, you know, again, making making the point that this isn't just about um, people who are homeless, for example. You know, you're talking about a substantial substantial proportion of, of the population who are challenged with, with data poverty. Um, and, and then our final speaker in this session, before we come to, to Emma, is um, Kath Deacon from Monmouth uh, Housing Association. So thank you very much, Kath. Thank you everyone and thanks for inviting me this morning. Um, I do have a PowerPoint, if you bear with me. 
mainly so I can hide behind it. Um, so I suppose I've come along to talk to you here about the social housing perspective around um, digital connectivity and data poverty amongst our tenants. Um, iConnect is a community renewal funded project. It's something that we um, identified, well, bear with me as this, thank you, um, as an issue quite some time ago about um, the extent to which our customers and indeed many other social housing tenants are more likely to be digitally excluded. In an area like Monmouthshire as well, we have the added um, difficulty, I suppose, with the rurality of, of some of our housing stock. Um, and we've also got a business need. We need to make sure as, you know, the cost of living crisis is very much with us. And that's that's also going to be reflected in our costs and what we need to pass on in rent to our tenants as well. So it's our aim to make sure that rental affordability is very much at the heart of everything that we do. So driving digital service provision to make sure that we can drive down costs is really important, but we can't do that by leaving our customers behind. That's absolutely not the way we need to go. But it's also about making sure that our communities are equipped to make the most of any digital opportunities and skills that are out, uh, that they need and those digital opportunities that are out there. Um, none of this will be news to anybody in this room about um, the level of digital inactivity. But there, there are layers to this, isn't there? Because whilst we may be able to knock doors in a lot in a lot of our communities, and people may have access via a phone that they, they're struggling to afford, but they still have access in that way. The reality is um, how much of that enables them to use a Microsoft package to be able to, you know, use those digital skills in a workplace or in terms of making their own um, options in life much more broad to them. So our aim with iConnect was to tackle digital exclusion. Um, but it's, it was a, you know, and this is, it's a very multi-strand project because we're looking at the technology, we're looking at our role as a housing provider and what, what role do we play in that community in terms of being an enabler for digital activity. Um, but it's also looking at the behaviours that we look at and what, what barriers there are through through people's behaviours and how people feel about using digital services and um, their own connectivity. And it's about trying to find ways, what, what actually works to support people across digital divide. What will, what will last? What, what are the things that are sustainable and that we can keep doing that are going to mean that this will grow and grow and grow and people will become far more confident in this world? Um, how can we actually extend that digital service provision so that we are able to keep a handle on our cost and, and benefit from, from the technologies that are available? And really importantly to me, as something that I've observed, is that people who are living in poverty have very little ability to impact the market. And the digital, digital market is driven by people who can afford to pay. So it's about how can we how can we help our residents become more active digital consumers and more confident digital consumers. So it's a five strand project. It involves community mesh, um, actual capital spend on trying to create community mesh that makes it uh, accessible for, for tenants. Um, there's a long term feasibility study and a partnership with the University of South Wales to try and you know, bring out some of the, the more underlying issues so that we can prepare and invest for the future. But for us, the, the crux of the issue has been in delivering face-to-face -face support in strands three and four. And with that, we've, we've got a live evaluation of the project as well. So just very quickly, the, the community mesh delivery has been very, very difficult very, very difficult. It's very expensive. It it's involves retrofitting old properties and it's been, you know, and 
you know, it's made us very aware of our own inexpertise in this area as well. So that's been a real challenge. We're cracking on with it so we can prove the concept, but it's a real challenge. Um, the feasibility side of it is fascinating, but it's a long term project. And, you know, we're going to have to wait to see what that looks like at the end of it and what our investment needs are going to be. The stuff that's really taken off and is in real demand is Beth and Gareth on the ground, delivering their face-to-face -face support with everything digital, but also about having conversations with people about making digital costs part of their budgeting framework and about thinking about getting the, you know, getting that digital access in there along with their electricity and gas bills. It's, it's about trying to have those conversations with people about how important this is for infrastructure. And it's been interesting that the, the biggest way of connecting hasn't been, the, 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 I suppose the, the catch to get people involved hasn't been skills and workplace concerns, it's been social and cultural. And that's, that seems to be the way to conquer some of those behavioural bar barriers and some of that reluctance. And it's been fascinating to see that. Um, and the, fin the final part of this project is an evaluation. What we want is to be able to tell people about the experience of this, all the good, all the bad, so that we can carry on informing the discussion about what's required and what community activity and infrastructure activity is required just to create that level playing field for people. So watch this space on the evaluation. But um, as, as Hamish has said, any questions at the end of it, I'm happy to answer. And that's our contact details. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Kath. A, a, another brilliant presentation. Um, it's really, it's really lovely to hear members of the network um, uh, share, sharing their experience, and that, that is to say, that is the point of the network is for that to happen. So, thank you, thank you so much. Um, and uh, uh, colleagues may want to ask more about Mesh. <laughs> There's a question that, there is a question in the in the chat already about Mesh, which is which is good. But thank you for, for the honesty. Um, and as you say, we will all be very keen to see the evaluation because it's so important that we learn we learn the lessons from e each other in these in these initiatives. Um, so we, we've heard a lot um, already. We've had several mentions of data bank um, uh, from our speakers uh, so far, and so it, it, it's fantastic that um, I can now introduce Emma Stone. So Emma, Emma is a member of the steering group um, of, of the Alliance um, and a very keen supporter of it um, from Good Things Foundation. And you're going to give us uh, the kind of UK perspective, I think, Emma. Yeah, that's brilliant. Uh, thank you so much, um, Hamish. So I work for Good Things Foundation. I'm Director of Evidence and Engagement. And as some of you all know, we're a digital inclusion charity that works across the UK. Um, and in Wales, we are really honoured to be supporting Compass in delivering Digital Communities Wales um, and, uh, and being an active member of this alliance as well. Um, I'll put in the chat our new strategy. We've just launched our new strategy. And the reason why I want to put that in there is because you will see that continuing to support the National Data Bank is a really key part of our new strategy right to the end of 2025, because we don't unfortunately see the need for this diminishing. Um, and the reason is that in terms of the kind of big UK picture, 2 million people, according to Ofcom's latest data, are struggling to afford broadband and mobile data bills. And we know, we all know that will increase because of the cost of living pressures more generally. And this year, as last year, there's been no change. Uh, still 6% of UK households are without internet access. So that's around one and a half million UK households. Uh, and so you situate that alongside knowing that around 10 million people still lack the most basic digital skills. And then the stories you've heard already from Gwyn and Catherine and Garain and Kath and the importance of addressing data poverty as part of the wider digital inclusion agenda just really comes to the fore. 
So I'll say a little bit more about the National Data Bank. Um, it is, it's a bit like a food bank, but for mobile data connectivity, which kind of makes me angry because I don't actually think that we should have food banks in this country. They're really vital. They, they absolutely make a huge difference to people, but a fairer society wouldn't have a need for food banks and it wouldn't have a need for the National Data Bank. Uh, and brilliantly, this is a genuine collaboration with industry. We couldn't have done this without Virgin Media O2 helping us to set it up. The data in the SIMs are donated by O2, then Vodafone came on board, then 3 came on board. And what they're all helping us to do is provide um, data connectivity through organizations um, like, uh, like Swansea Mad. Um, because we know that you know who needs this. And so it is a trust-based model. So um, housing associations, community groups, community organizations, you can join our network, which is free. You can register to become a distributor um, of uh, the SIM cards and vouchers. Uh, and you decide the eligibility within parameters around this is for adults who are 18 plus years old and from a low income household, but you don't have to be finding out about their benefit status. We trust you to know who needs this. Um, if you want to find out more about the detail, we're working with Compass uh, in order to do an online Wales meetup. So for organisations specifically in Wales on Tuesday, the 28th of June. So we'll make sure information about that is sent out through the Alliance so you can find out more. We're also in the process of doing uh, Welsh translations of key information about the National Data Bank as well to make it easier to promote within Wales. Um, I think the other thing that I wanted to briefly say is that we've heard really powerfully today the importance of mobile data connectivity. And of course, there are, there are other solutions that are available as well, including in the area of Wi-Fi and broadband. Ofcom uh, last month uh, produced a consultation and that drew attention to the fact that they estimate that only around 1.2% of eligible customers are accessing social tariffs for broadband. And there will be lots of reasons for that, but one of them will be that people are just unaware of it. And actually, we know a lot of the organisations in our network. Some of you may not be aware of social tariffs um, for broadband. It, it kind of really chimes with what Kath was saying about you get into this area and you realise you might know lots about supporting digital skills. But when it comes to data connectivity, mobile broadband, that's not an easy market to navigate. You can't actually easily find social tariffs through consumer switching websites. And even to use consumer switching websites, you need a level of internet access and digital skills. So there's a real poverty premium issue here as well. I did a, I did a seminar for an organization called Policy in Practice. And this is a group, there were about 300 people in the virtual room. They are all in the jobs of doing money guidance. So housing associations, citizens advice, local branches of Age UK. And I asked, how confident are you to support people around their mobile and broadband data bills as part of the cost of living uh, crisis? And two thirds said they were not confident or not very confident. And only 7% said they felt really confident and they were mostly in citizens advice. So, so, for, so that's one of the other things we're working up is a short guide for community organizations to to help them better support people and start to open up these conversations, know where they can signpost, a bit of information around social tariffs, a bit of information around the National Data Bank, um, and really going to Kath's point about even encouraging people to open up that conversation, as, especially as the cost of living pressures bite. Um, I'll share a few more links in the chat because we've also, we're commissioning some Data Poverty Lab fellows. One of those is going to be exploring that issue around, you know, how do we frame this as, an, as a human right, as an essential utility, what are the policy solutions that might come from those framings. 
One of them is looking at community solutions to this. So Kathy, it would be brilliant to be able to patch her into, you know, the community mesh project, because there are other projects like that across the country. And um, but but uh, I, I think I suppose one of the reasons why we're doing that is we also want to not only be part of responding to need now, but thinking about what a better, fairer future system might look like as well. So that's why with Nominet support, we've also got the Data Poverty Lab. That's why uh, we're part of the consortium on the minimum digital living standard, including the Welsh government funded minimum digital living standard for Wales. Those are long, you know, we want to be part of pointing to a better future. Thank you, Hamish. Um, Emma, thank thank you very much. Um, really helpful oversight, and I think I think important to to to, to emphasise that data bank, which clearly is brilliant, and there's loads of comments in the chat about how helpful it is. It is proving that that, that it isn't only the, the only solution, and things like social tariffs are are really important. Um, and uh, in response to that, I see that uh, Nick Speed uh, from BT, who do have a social tariffs, um, has has posted um, some links uh, in, in the chat for people to look at as well. So we've just got um, uh, uh, we've got. Um, a few minutes uh, for some questions, six or seven minutes for questions. Um, can I, so I'll, I'll pick, pick them out in the chat, so please do put them in the chat. Uh, there are an awful lot of comments in the chat, um, not quite so many questions, but can I just start by posting a question uh, to, to all of you really, which is, are you are you seeing that already that your the, the clients and the users and the, 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 the customers that you all work with, are you seeing them already beginning to cut back on their 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 spend on on data um, because of the cost of living challenges that are present now and are they know are coming? And so, is is are people seeing that as a discretionary item that they can get, you know get rid of quite early on? Um, and is that therefore going to make data poverty even worse? Um, I think from as I mentioned, asylum seekers only get just over forty pound a week to live on, so. As I said already, I mean, they don't have data to start with, so they're not having to cut back on it because they, they've never, ever been able to, it's never been a priority. Um, so, um, yeah, <laughs> basically, um, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's already, a, it's, it's, it's an unaffordable challenge for that them is, already. I mean, I mean, Gwen, what do you, do you know what, what you're finding amongst your sellers? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think in response to this question, like um, I don't think I've sort of explicitly heard anyone say they're going to, you know, cut back on data spend. But I think it's it's definitely, you know, it's very predictable that that, that will happen um, for for many people. Um, it, there's a range of, like I said, there's a, there's a range of um, people that that choose to sell the big issue, and and they do have a range of backgrounds. But the yeah the um, the, the the defining feature is that they they are all living in in some form of poverty and um i i, I know from speaking to many of our um vendors that almost everyone is on is on pay as you go um and it becomes more expensive you know the more you need to top up so i know already a lot of people they, they essentially do the minimum top up to to gain access you know they do like 10 pounds a month or something and, and they they try and make it stretch so any extra squeeze on their finances is going to make that really hard and it's going to make any extra spend even more impossible basically um yeah that's that's what i know so so um and, and i'd be interested to know uh Garrett, what what you're finding too. I mean, I'm, I'm, the reason I'm asking is I'm interested in whether we're, we're making the point that we think data data is a fundamental a fundamental need now, and I just wonder whether whether that's how it is seen by by people who are struggling, or whether they see it as something that's discretionary, and that they would you know would they ditch that before they ditched something else? I'm just just interested to know how people are prioritising it. In fact. I think it's uh, very much on a, an individual basis where um, a lot of the people we're working with didn't have data to begin with. So that's why the data bank has been good for them because they will get six months um, data. Uh, so they haven't got to then prioritize for some people it's food over internet or whatever. Um, so I think, yeah, 
there's going to be people uh, who are um, going to try and reduce their own expenditure, their own costs, um, because food and your know, gas and electric are going to be a priority uh, over getting on the internet. Um, so I think the data bank helps with that problem a little bit, um, or quite a lot actually, um, for a lot of people. Uh, and the, the social tariffs, uh, I think, are going to see an increase as well, whether people are on benefits will um, go for them. Um, how, what kind of speed people are, can get on the social tariffs compared to uh, on a, a normal tariff, I don't know. I haven't done that analysis, but that would be quite an interesting conversation. Because um, I think the social tariffs and cheap deals are going to be a way forward for a lot of people. But I, yeah, people are going to choose food and over internet all day, every day. Thanks, uh, Garrett. I mean, uh, Nick Speed from BT. Um, you have a social tariff. I don't. I don't know whether you are in a position to give us a, an idea of. Well, first of all, to answer that very specific question about about the, the the data, the amount of data you get on your on your tariff, but but actually, what what you what the take up of it has been. I mean, picking up Emma's point that there's a lot of there isn't much awareness of it, perhaps. Um, <clears throat> Can we unmute Nick so he can talk to us? Yeah, thanks. Hi, thanks. I've just, um, yeah, you can see me now as well. So Thank thanks, you. Hamish. Um, yeah, to answer the specific question. So the um, we changed the social tariff and part of the reason why we changed the social tariff was to guarantee higher speeds. So the link that I've put in the chat bar tells you that you can get up to uh, 67 megabits per second um, on it's um, it's an improvement on the previous social tariff that was why we sort of changed it to guarantee uh, uh, better speeds and um, to answer your question about um, interest in this we're definitely seeing more interest in the last few months so um, I don't know how many months but in the last few months we're saying that about 10 percent of our new customers are um, contacted us are going straight on to the social tariff so um but the the challenge here is that you know um it's this the social tariff and not everybody offers the social tariffs um and social tariffs obviously are a solution that could be available all over the country rather than some of the in other initiatives which are sort of restricted to certain postcodes and where there are groups that are you know working to deliver data etc but a social tariff is obviously something that you know is based on eligibility what we do know obviously is the eligibility criteria is increasing there are going to be more people um, over this cost of living crisis that are going to become eligible for these tariffs so really we need the central government to be acting in the same way that they have acted to support energy customers um, by with um, looking at the warm home discount we need something similar for um, for data and we believe firmly that the a social tariff is obviously a great idea because it can sort of cover a whole household. Um, a data package can support, you know, is related to sort of one device. So, you might, okay, you might swap your device around the house, but that doesn't really work when you've got someone trying to do homeschooling at the some, same time that someone's trying to do their job or someone's trying to have a consultation with the GP, whereas obviously um, broadband to a house can include everybody in the house being able to access at the same time so that's the reason why we've gone down that route but i think you know it's coming out loud and clear to me from this conversation that we were, you know, people at the front line are all anticipating increased need for people to get support on this otherwise people are going to go dark it's not a question of just heating or eating but there are other vital things that people need to be able to access in this day and age um, and you know, people are making difficult decisions about their spending priorities thanks Nick. Um, I'm, I'm just going to come to Karen but just before I do there's a question saying is is that 10 percent of new customers is that across the UK or is that a Welsh figure it's a UK figure yeah thank you and, and presumably existing customers can request to switch to the social tariff but perhaps are not of course of course and um you know, and um, to just put a little bit of Welsh flavour onto it, the um, you know, one of the teams that deals with customers that are in challenging situations with their bills, and when people do fall into problems with their bills, the team that they contact is based in Cardiff, and obviously when you know they're speaking to those customers, the what they will do with them is work out, you know, well, actually, are you eligible for a social turf? And you know that changes obviously through time as people sort of move on and off of benefits. Thanks, Nick. Um, we're Essentially out of time, but Garrett, you had your hand up. Did you want to, to uh, add something to that? Uh, only that 
quick point, really. Um, with some of the social tariffs, especially the DWP one, it's discretionary on the work coach. So they decide if someone's eligible for a social tariff or not. So I just want to make people aware of that. Fantastic. Thank you. There is some really rich content in the chat. Um, uh, so, so please do um, keep an eye on that. Uh, lots of links, lots of, of, of advice and, and, and connections being made. So that's really good. So what we're going to do now um, is uh, thank you very much to, to all our speakers. That's really set us up well, I think, for the conversation we're now about to have. So we're now going to go into breakout. Um, and uh, you just need to, as it were, sit still and you'll find yourself in a, in a breakout room by the wonders of Zoom. Um, and we're gonna ask you um, over the next 15 minutes to focus on um, three things. So are the people you work with facing data poverty issues? I think we may know the answer to that, um, but, but perhaps some of you uh, aren't encountering that problem. Um, what is the cause of those issues? Um, and, and being reasonably precise about that so we can understand exactly what the challenges are. Um, what is your organization or other organizations in your area doing to support um, those people and what else needs or could be done? And how confident are you in supporting the people to access the best broadband or data packages available to meet? Uh, their needs and that's a reference in a way to the conversation we've just had about lack of awareness and lack of maybe uh, knowledge and skills in, in what is quite a technical area uh, I think. So those are the questions we'd like you to talk about in the in the breakout group um, and uh, we will um, now send you to those uh, there'll be someone in there to, to work with you on those questions and we'll put the questions in the chat as well in case you've forgotten them by the time you get there. Thanks very much indeed. And Fantastic. I think I think we'll start. So, um, a, a, a very warm welcome, uh, Borada uh, uh, Lee. Thank you very much. It's great, great pleasure to welcome um, the Deputy Minister for Climate Change. Um, that in itself is a is a is a really important subject. Um, but uh, here, particularly to talk about um, the bit of your portfolio that is digital connectivity, infrastructure, PSBA, fast broadband, and mobile, um, in this session, which is is devoted. To, to the challenges of data poverty. So thank you very much indeed for making the time to speak to us and we're, we're really looking forward to hearing from you. Well, ha happy to be with you. I'm, I'm afraid I, I have no profound or insightful original thoughts to offer you. Uh, so I'll, I'm gonna speak briefly uh, and then I'd be really keen to have a conversation really and get uh, a sense from you all who've been working in this field for a long time of what more you think we should be doing. Uh, yeah, I guess the obvious point to make is this is a tough neck to crack. Many of you have been trying to crack it for a long time uh, and uh, it is not easy, clearly. Uh, and we have multiple problems. Um, yes, we have data poverty. Um, that's partly a reflection of the fact we have poverty um, and that is a perennial issue. Uh, we know from uh, the work that you've all been doing and we've been doing with operators and so on uh, that uh, and the work that Nest and a lab have done, that what something like 14% of people in Wales experience uh, data poverty. Uh, we pretty sure that the work done by the operators is necessary, but not sufficient. Um, there is a, a, a lot we've done during the pandemic, but that simply points to the fact that there is no simple single solution to this. So we've given out lots of devices, uh, for example, uh, but quite a lot of them were never switched on, which I think tells us quite a lot. Um, so, you know, I, I, I continue to return to the theme that, that the, one of the key things we can do here is get user need right. Because for me, user need accepts that some people are not digitally enabled and ne may never, never be digitally enabled and should not be excluded from using services. Um, and I think it's a broad enough spectrum that, that it turns it on its head. It doesn't ask the, the user to fit into the convenience of the service. It does it the other way around. So there needs to be, particularly in the transitional period, a, maybe a paper-based or a phone-based or a analog way into services, uh, as well as a digital way into services. And for me, a digital design approach does not always bring a, a digital technology outcome. Um, so we use the term digital, digital, it means lots of different things. Uh, I use digital in its broadest cultural sense. And the phrase I've used a bit now is it's not about kit, it's about culture. Uh, and so get, getting public services to understand the need to design services with users at their center 
uh, I think is, I still think is, is, is the key approach. And we've done quite a lot on that, it's a long way to go. Um, it's been a year now since our digital strategy has been uh, in place. The Digital Centre for Public Services uh, is really uh, making great strides uh, of progress and is um, we're creating as well our ecosystem of uh, digital leaders uh, and the CDOs, uh, hopefully about to appoint a CDO for NHS at last. Uh, so it's a combination, I think, of digital standards, uh, about uh, capability, uh, uh, leadership understanding, uh, and having uh, a user-centred focus uh, at its uh, at its heart. And as I'm saying this, I realise I haven't plugged my battery in, so I'm going to have to simultaneously talk and plug my computer in before I disappear on you. Um, so, so that you know, in in in, 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 in rather than just run through a script I've been given, which frankly bores me and bores you. Those are our those essentially sort of the key messages I want I want to say. You know, yes, we are doing work on a national minimal digital living standard, and that's going to be important. A piece of research uh, feeding into a broader piece of UK research. There's a bunch of other stuff going on too, uh, but I think we should be uh, should start off with humility that we haven't got this right, uh, and it's not an easy one to get right. Um, but this, I think, this community of practice, which in effect, I think, is what what's being created here, is the key for sharing the learning and iterating. And I think that is the other key point of digital for me, is you know, there's no there's no big bang moment. We just have to try, feel our way, change, scale, uh, and uh, keep at it. I think. Um, so that's I promised you at the start, and I didn't. I lived up to my promise. Politician keeps promise. I have no profound original thoughts for you. Um, so those are my initial thoughts, but I'm really keen to hear what you think and to have a conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Minister. And I, and I think, um, I mean, what, what has, I think, come out of our discussions um, before you joined us is, is probably a, a couple of things. There's been a lot of discussion about, about Data Bank and uh, uh, Emma Stone from Good Things Foundation has, has told us a bit more about that. And it's clear that, that many organizations across Wales and members of our network are, are at, or, or are, are directing their, 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 their clients, customers, service users to Data Bank, which has been really helpful and, and is an initiative you know, very much driven by the operators um, in, in partnership. Um, and we have also uh, briefly touched on the question of social tariffs for, for broadband and uh, Nick Speed, who's actually just left us, but from BT, was making the distinction between um, the approach they've taken, which they think is important to get houses connected rather than necessarily individuals and, and data data bundles. Um, and you could, I'm sure, argue that in different ways, but it's another contribution. And, and I think there was a sense that there wasn't great awareness amongst um, people suffering from data poverty about some of those those issues around you know the opportunities for social tariffs and, and so on. So I think there's, there is definitely a communication uh, element there. Uh, and Emma, what, from the kind of UK perspective, um, what would you like to pick up from, from what, the, what, what Lee has just told us? Um, yeah, th thank you so much. So I, so I suppose one question thinking about it from both the UK and a uh, Wales perspective is around the opportunities that the Welsh Government continues to have and could make more of around addressing data poverty within Wales. So obviously some of the solutions like social tariffs are across the UK, but in what other areas might the Welsh Government show, show leadership on, pr on promoting those? So it's, it's a, such an interesting policy area in terms of as soon as it touches obviously social policy, very, very uh, devolved uh, area. And, and I think, I suppose the other connection is in terms of the rising costs of living. Um, and that's something that really came out strongly through a lot of the discussions today, uh, is that connectivity for people is gonna be a bigger issue as, as the kind of cost of living crisis deepens. And as you said, fundamentally, this is about poverty. And we would, we would say the same thing. But also there are choices that can be made here about how this is addressed. And so it'd be really interesting to hear your thoughts on, on what more the Welsh Government could be doing to lead uh, in this area. Well, Emma, if I had more thoughts, as I've told you, uh, but keen, keen, to hear, keen to hear your thoughts. What do you, what do you think we should be doing? So, so I, think, um, I think some of this is about helping to make a more explicit connect, 
connection between internet access and how important that is and that not dropping off the agenda when we're thinking around the um the the real crisis that a lot of households are going are going to be facing uh, one of the other issues that has come up is about how we could do more and this is something we could do with you as an as an alliance is about promoting the solutions that are already out there because this is a complex market to navigate uh, and it can be really difficult not only for individual people citizens but also actually for charities community organizations uh, even housing associations to know how best to signpost so there is a support for promotion thing there and I think the other the other part is is then about recognizing the importance of programs like Digital Communities Wales and like the work that you know a lot of the organizations in the Alliance are doing, which is creating that social infrastructure. So I know you were talking earlier about maybe some of the physical infrastructure um, that's within the remit, but but actually there is such importance in terms of continuing to build and support that community social infrastructure because these are the organizations that people turn to when they're in crisis. I'm sure there'll be loads of other people in the, in the virtual room who have things to add, but I think, you know, your support in raising awareness, promoting it and connecting it to the wider cost of living agenda for Wales would be really helpful. Sure, I was talking more about service design rather than physical infrastructure. I think we've, I personally think we've focused an awful lot on physical infrastructure. And I think we need to, you know, clearly important, but, 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 but limited unless people are using it in a different way. Um, but your point about uh, signposting a complex landscape, I think is a very strong one. And I'd be very happy to, to work together to see if we can do more on that for sure. Uh, and generally, you know, open to your suggestions of what more we should be doing. Fantastic. Um, uh, Simon Harris, you've got your hand up. Could, could I just uh, perhaps say which organisation you're from? Um, yeah, am I unmuted? Yes, I am. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I'm from the Competition and Markets Authority, which looks to work with businesses to make sure they're delivering services that are beneficial to consumers and whether or not we, we can intervene. My background's co-op centre, I should say Compass, uh, and uh, and business in the community. But I, it, I agree with this whole point about user need. You know, it's Nick Nick has posted something on the chat that says the FBT have, on, uh, have a social tariff. But how do we get all the organisations that offer social tariffs to to she work together is a real issue because we're talking about businesses that compete with one another. But if you understand user need and the vulnerable consumers and the people who are eligible for social tariffs, if we get a really good understanding of that and link it up with the individual businesses that offer particular social tariffs, for example, I'm sure that the service design, as Lee refers to, could be far better um, uh, but but the challenge is to get businesses to to work together to share their sort of their, their different sort of social tariffs and reach out and make the connection to the vulnerable consumers and the people who have who, who have data poverty. It, it's a real difficult issue to, to crack. And I've, I've said in the breakout session, I use my mother as an example. You know, we've got to fight my sister and myself really hard to get for her the sort of tariffs um, that, uh, that she was entitled to. There's no way that she'd be able to do that. And the only way she connects with the outside world is through letters through the post. So it, 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 it's, it's a real difficult challenge. But my point, I suppose, is connecting businesses and can they, can we get a better service design to match what Lee says is, is a better understanding of, of users and, and their need. But I don't offer a solution, I'm afraid. Thanks very much, sir. Um, and let me bring in uh, Catherine Amani. Just submit myself. Um, yeah, thank you, Hamish. Thank you, Minister. Um, Catherine Amani from Displaced Persons in Action. Um, I'm not going to, I think what I'm going to say just segues really nicely into what Simon is saying. One of our main issues in DPIA is that we just simply don't know the numbers that we're dealing with in terms of asylum seekers. So, Obviously, the 14% of people in Wales who suffer from data poverty is a terribly high figure. Um, but if you add on top of that people who are asylum speakers and we just don't know the numbers, um, it's very difficult for us to put in place support when we don't know the numbers that we're dealing with. So if there's anything, it might be a little bit of a tangent. Um, but if there's any way of getting some of that data, that would be enormously helpful to us so that we can plan a strategy 
to support how we um, create or make digital inclusion a reality for both refugees for whom we do have figures and asylum seekers for whom we don't. And they're obviously even worse off than, than, um, than everybody else. So um, that's just like, so it just links in with what Simon was saying. Thank you. So, so there is a question, isn't there, about and that, that, that the lack of, of hard data is slightly impeding the ability to plan for, for this and, and to understand. We, exactly. we, we, all have, we all have a sense that there is a, the scale of it is both challenging now and likely to get a lot worse in the next few months with all the other financial challenges, but, but we don't really have good data to, to base it on, which is, is, is a shame. I, I, Emma, sorry, I keep coming back to you, but is there a, at a UK level or in, or in, in other bits of the UK are that do they have better data on this? So um so Ofcom uh I mean Ofcom like with the the Lloyds Banking Group and other data that's helpful at a UK level. Uh but um but I think going to Catherine's point actually what you're talking about is is the lack of data. She's absolutely right a lack of data that really drills down into more specific uh needs in relation to certain groups. Um, uh, even uh, setting uh, people seeking asylum uh, to one side, we don't even have the possibility to disaggregate in relation to different minority ethnic um, uh, characteristics and groups and communities. Yeah, yeah, so there is a general data issue here. Yeah. I think also there, there are interesting things around um, Ofcom and, the, and obviously Ofcom gets data from, for example, BT and others, and that's available on a, on a UK level. There are obviously commercial sensitivities there, but being, you know, it, um, it, there are maybe conversations to be had there about what data or what um, cuts of data could be shared in order to get a better understanding of if, for example, there are particular cold spots across the UK or within Wales around a uh, take up of social tariffs, for example, because that could then target more promotional activity. Um, but I, but I, I suspect that might be quite difficult to to get. Yeah, I mean, I wonder, um, Minister, whether that is the sort of thing that the Welsh government could be asking. Um, the operators, you know, that we were hearing from BT that they, you know, they've got a, a, a very good social tariff. Um, Ten percent, I think he was saying, of their new customers are going straight onto it. But I'd be very interested to know how many of their existing customers who are eligible for a social tariff are being encouraged to move to one by by them, which may be a rather lower rate, I fancy. Well, I'm happy to use that relationship to try and see if we can leverage some information out of them. I must say, getting good data out of both. ET and Ofcom is, uh, is sometimes a challenge, um, but uh, but certainly we're happy to try. Thank you, um, uh, Dave from Parago. You, you're you've been very ac active in the chat. Do, do you want to just perhaps pick up one or two of the points you've been making um, uh, from from the, your breakout? You can't unmute yourself. Can we unmute Dave from Parago? <laughs> Dave Floyd. <laughs> There you are. We're all powerful, Dave. Oh, we've muted you again. There you are. Yeah, there we are. There's like some kind of godlike function that was image. Yes. Um, yeah. So it, yeah, it was quite interesting. So the, the kind of the breakout room that we had, and, and again, Marco Marco picked it up there in the chat, and it is something that Lee said. Um, but from the from the breakout session that that I was in, and, and some of the people speaking in there. Um, what became apparent is actually talk of social tariffs and, and then there were people there who were working on the front line with people who was the first time they've heard of social tariffs today and they are actually working with people suffering from data poverty and try, trying to get them access to those services so I think as much as anything else from and even from listening to people like um, Nick and, and listening to um, the, the competition authority and kind of the different network providers and the stuff that Emma has said actually the, the infrastructure in inverted commas seems to be there um, what is potentially lacking is is the service design as, as Marco said and as, and as Lee said around how to make the people that need to be aware aware of um, what support they can get, how do they get it, so that they can help those people 
uh, who who need that support. So as much as anything else, it feels to me like it, it's it's a it's a it's a requirement that there needs to be more awareness of the solutions that are out there from an infrastructure point of view. Um, there needs to be more communication of those services to the people that need to, to know it so that they can better engage with people who are, who are suffering data poverty and support them to get access to those services because because said it, it seems to be a communication communication awareness and engagement issue as much as anything else it's not just about the infrastructure yeah and 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 relatively cheaper to communicate than to actually provide a lot of that stuff so so it, 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 to have to have solutions that people are not accessing because they're unaware of them is 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 clearly not not good so it, i mean dave do you think that that clearly there's a, an opportunity for the network to help disseminate some of that uh, information um we you know we have amongst us an amazing array of of, of richness of, of knowledge and and indeed some of the big providers so so we ought to be able to do something around that i think yeah abs absolutely right. and i and i think that that's one of the things that as i said the, the the breakout session that we had there's there's people in there who are supporting people in data poverty and, and the first thing they've said with the, the questions that sarah kind of um asked us to run through were it's the first time they've learned of some of these social tariffs um so just like I said, making making people more aware of those solutions, and this this network is a great place to start. Because I I don't know what percentage it is, but when it, when Emma started talking about social tariffs, as she said, there'll be many people in this room who've never come across them before. Um, so I suppose the question to ask is why aren't people aware of them, and what can be done to make people more aware of those things? Um, exactly. Thank you. And I was just uh, Geraint. Sorry, just just say what you've popped in the chat. That would be. Uh, yeah, um, I spoke to DWP uh, last week, um, and there's a, a bit of a, a transcript, really, or a, a checklist of the um, format in which the work coach decides if someone's eligible for internet on a social tariff. Um, so if the work coaches in DWP aren't aware of social tariffs, how on earth is the person who wants that social tariff supposed to be aware of it? Yeah, exactly. So, and I mean, this is a, a feature in general of people not not accessing benefits and, and and schemes that they can isn't it across a wide range of policy areas um we're just about out of time um minister ed a, a final word from from you uh, hopefully you found that a, a helpful conversation we would love to work more with you on this sure well you know it's it needs to be an ongoing conversation doesn't it so i think you know the the, the theme is about how we can just um stimulate awareness then i think that's you know, let's take that away and f and figure out what, what we what we can do together on that i think that's a, a, a good concrete action thank you very much I, I i would i would agree so um uh, can i just take this opportunity to thank all all our speakers um uh, the, the the to you lee thank you very much i know how busy you are with 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 your responsibilities um to to emma and and gwyn and catherine and garrett and kath as well and and as always a big thank you to all of you members of our network for the way you've engaged in this some really brilliant stuff in the chat which we'll capture um and and i know the the, the discussions in the break out rooms were, were really powerful as well. Um, so thank you so much. Another great session of the network and we really look forward to seeing you at our next meeting. So thank you very much indeed.